What's up, guys? Welcome back to Title Gardens. This show tank has been teased on this channel for about two years now, and I really haven't given it a dedicated video. It's got the bones to be one of the most spectacular show tanks in this whole facility, but until recently, it was kind of cursed or something. There was always something going wrong and little things that we had to fix. I'll get into all of that and more. Let's begin with an overview with what we are looking at in the first place. This show tank is a 600 gallon peninsula style aquarium that measures 10 and a half feet long, four feet wide, and 24 inches tall. It is a massive beast on its own, but it's plumbed into one of the big farming systems, so the total water volume is likely over 2,000 gallons. A peninsula tank is so called because it maximizes the viewable area on the long sides of the aquarium by extending out into the room. This is in contrast to most aquariums that are set up against a wall, so they only have one long face that's viewable. Because of this aesthetic wrinkle, peninsula tanks are oftentimes used as room dividers. The challenge with a peninsula style design is the logistics of getting flow to the other end of the tank without messing up those elegant aesthetics. This is especially difficult in super long aquariums like this one that's a little over 10 feet in length. If this was a regular aquarium, it would be fairly trivial to install a bunch of power heads discreetly but that's going to be a lot more difficult to do when you're trying to keep 75% of that glass uncluttered. It is possible to install power heads on the three showcase viewing panes, but that's not that easy and wire management is also a consideration. Those pumps need to get powered from above as you don't want a cord dangling down from the aquarium to your stand in front of a viewing pane. If you can navigate these water flow logistics, you end up with a very cool looking tank. What we did to provide flow in this tank was a combination of power heads on the overflow box shooting down the length of the tank, as well as two closed loops to provide flow in and around the rocks. The power heads we chose were Ciche Voyager 10s. It's their largest power head model and can easily send water down the full 10 foot length of the tank in a narrow cone. I like these pumps because they're relatively inexpensive and ultra reliable. They do take up a good bit of space inside the aquarium though, but on a tank this size, up against a black background, they are easy to ignore. This tank has a coast to coast overflow box spanning the entire back section of the tank, so it was important that the mounting magnet for this pump is waterproof. Unfortunately that overflow box design eliminates pumps like Ecotec's Vortec line where there is like a dry side with electronics. The only other pump I strongly considered was the Abyss AFC 150, but ironically this tank is a little small for that pump, which was really designed for medium-sized public aquarium displays, and in this tank it would probably be running at well under 50% power for what might be 10 times the cost of a CJ. One feature of that pump I do like is that it can flow in reverse to make interesting flow patterns. The CJ is just a straight on and off pump. So who knows, maybe in the distant future I might try one just as a matter of professional curiosity, but for right now, I'm going with these. Speaking of Abyss, I am using them in closed loops on this tank. I have two Abyss A200 pumps in a very straightforward implementation. Each has a single inch and a half input and a single inch and a half output. We have a suction strainer on the input side and a four-way custom lock line on the output side. In the past, people asked where to get those and unfortunately it was something that was made for us by our plumber. I think it's just a three inch cap that's been drilled and tapped to accept four three-quarter inch lock line adapters. 
it gives us a lot of flexibility directing the flow, and it's something that we can hide pretty easily in the aquascape. As for lighting, we have something very different overhead. The original plan was to use Ecotech radions like we have in most of this facility, but at one point I was considering something like mangroves, and the radions would be a little bit too close to the surface of the water. Since we already had a similar lighting system over our SPS show tank, I wanted to try something completely different lighting system-wise over this tank to further differentiate it from the SPS show. We ended up going with these Orphic Amazonas lights with 15 degree optics. The Amazonas have modular optics, so you can go from 15 all the way up to 60 degrees if you wanted to. These lights are designed for much larger and deeper public aquariums, but I really like how high above the tank that they can be mounted. I think that these lights can be used on tanks that are literally 20 feet deep. Orphic did send us some of the other optics that we could swap in for more spread, but right now I'm really liking the 15 degrees. In the future, if we had a lot of time on our hands, we might swap in the 30s just to see what they look like, but no hurry on that. The 15s though don't have the most even spread in this configuration, but I do like how it minimizes the light bleed that gets onto the floor. The install of these fixtures was a breeze once we got these two overhead beams. The beams are hollow, so the electronics can sit up in there, and we wired in two 20 amp circuits just for them. As for the filtration, this Peninsula show tank shares a sump with one of the farming systems, so it benefits from the larger water volume, as well as all of that husbandry infrastructure that's already been built out. The bulk of the filtration is handled by a protein skimmer, but in addition, we have some marine pure blocks, we also have an 80 watt UV sterilizer and an ozone system by Ozotech. This was the very first system that we ever tried ozone on and we've been really happy with the results so far. The water clarity in this peninsula tank looks otherworldly because looking through the side of the aquarium, it looks like there's no water at all. The fish look like they're just hovering in air. Just love that aesthetic. As for maintenance of chemistry, we're doing four things basically. Water changes, calcium reactor, calcwasser doser, and two-part dosing. Let's quickly, like really quickly, go over each of those in turn. We do mostly small water changes frequently as a result of shipping corals out and small scale like scraping and siphoning of detritus. We don't do the massive water changes so much these days. We're basically using the water as a delivery method either for outbound orders or detritus removal. Afterwards, we can top off the tanks with a combination of fresh or salt water to achieve target salinity. The water delivery system is still one of my favorite things about this place. We have these pressurized lines coming from a central water station and it makes maintenance like this so much easier. Next up, we have the calcium reactor. I've always liked using calcium reactors. They are super low maintenance and do a great job of stabilizing the system. They're not great at elevating any particular level, but holding levels consistent, very, very strong technology. The only downside is that they're really big and heavy, especially when you get to the scale. And there's something that I might look to upgrade in the future because Geo makes some models for commercial applications that comes apart in sections, so it becomes a lot more manageable. This one is doing well so far, but once these systems are jam-packed full of stony corals, it might struggle to keep up. That brings us to Kalkwasser. This has been a very new addition to our repertoire here. I've been a big believer in Kalkwasser since the old days. Been doing this for about 30 something years. Kalkwasser has always worked. I don't know what it is about calcium hydroxide solution, but it does something magical for a tank. It's especially helpful for raising pH, which we kind of desperately need in this building. That's another story entirely. Long story short, we have low pH. The reason that I stopped using it for a good long while is that it is an easy thing to screw up. And in a commercial facility, stuff needs to be very screw up resistant. If you're sloppy with the implementation of Calcwasser, 
you could very easily chemical burn an entire system of corals. Speaking from experience there, I was the screw up. Now that we have it on a controlled dosing pump, I am much more confident that it's going to be done properly with the least amount of risk. I think as it gets ramped up, we might be dosing upwards of 10 gallons of calc per day per system. Lastly, we have two-part dosing in case all of that wasn't enough to meet the calcium and alkalinity demands. I'm hoping that once we dial in the calc washer system, it won't be as necessary as it was in the past, but it's nice to have this available in case that we have this uptick in demand. Okay. So that was a whirlwind tour of this tank. Let's talk about the animals in here, starting with the fish. We've got a collection of tangs going on. We've got this really big flamingi, and we got him when he was maybe about three inches, and now he's easily double or triple that size. We've got a trio of tamini tangs, an Achilles tang, and a long-nosed black tang. To go along with these tangs, we have a small group of antheus, Mostly lyre tails, but there are a couple of Bartlets in there as well. The Antheus thing is something that I'd like to do a bit better. They seem fine, but every now and again one's just going to disappear, and I have to do some mental math to try and remember how many that we had originally. I would eventually like to have about 18 or so in this tank, as I think that they do better in larger groups. Whenever I look at this tank, I don't see a lot of aggression issues with them, but I think having a larger aquarium with lots of rocks helps in that regard. Still, a larger group I think will go a long way towards diffusing any aggression that may be happening that I'm just not seeing. If you couldn't tell already, I wanted to go with an orange theme with the fish in this tank to make it visually distinctive from the fish in other aquariums. I even considered getting a few more Achilles tanks, but Acanthus tanks are big old jerks, and I don't know how well that would work out in this tank now that there's one that's been established. When setting this all up, it took a while for the black tang and the Achilles tang to settle down, so I don't really want to risk it by adding more. It would look cool though to have a tank with several Achilles tanks. They are my all-time favorite. As for the aquascape and coral, it is a hodgepodge of random large overgrowth from the farm. It was always meant to be a mixed reef, so it is kind of this constantly changing mosaic of random stuff that my staff and my dad tweak every few days. Every few days, something is getting added or moved. Something. I've learned to embrace the chaos of the system's coral choices. If it looks like there's no rhyme or reason to this, it's because there isn't really. And next week, it will be all different anyways. So unless there's something that's fallen over or about to fight something else, I personally don't really mess with it. So why haven't I talked about this tank until now? For a number of reasons, it just wasn't quite right, and I was in no real hurry to do any filming. Early on, it got a bunch of Aptasia to show up out of nowhere. Maybe it was on the cleanup crew or something. But over time, a few small Aptasia turned into really big ones. And then they started to multiply in number. Nothing too crazy, but the individuals were big fat ones, maybe about like 2 inches in diameter. You will never guess what I did to solve this problem. Nothing. Nothing at all. I was planning on introducing a copper band butterfly to this system, but there's a pecking order of tanks that get copper bands, and a show tank is way down the wait list compared to, say, a farming tank. So long story short, no copper band was going to come to the rescue. What did come to the rescue was some Bergia nudibranx. There happened to be some Bergias in the farming system, and eventually they migrated into this tank. So like magic one day, all the giant Aptasia were just gone. This overall system is very large. Like I mentioned, it's something in the ballpark of 2,000 gallons, and every now and again, we'll see an Aptasia pop up, and then disappear later when the Nudibranx track it down. As of right this second, I would have a hard time finding any in this show tank, so at least I can be happy about that. At one point, my fish in here got sick. It was very, very odd because it happened when we added a small group of Antheus, 
The thing is, the Antheists were quarantined here for over a month and never at any point showed signs of illness. Even when some of the other fish got sick, the Antheists were completely healthy. But it was curious timing because once we put them into the 600 gallon tank, the tangs in particular, the black tang and the Achilles tang, broke out in what looked like ick. The nice thing about this tank is that we're able to isolate it from the rest of the system and treat it. So we gave it a couple of weeks in Prazi in case it was a fluke issue and another couple of weeks in Ruby Reef's kick ick. We also added a couple of cleaner shrimp along the way. I don't remember exactly, but I think we also fed some medicated food, some metrodiazole, just in case there were some internal parasite issues. I figured if we were doing a de facto fish treatment, we may as well try to cover all the bases. Gotta say, it worked out. All the fish survived, and they got over what was bothering them. I guess the last thing that stopped me from doing an update was that this tank just didn't look like it had much going on in it for the longest time. It was more or less just bare rock. We were so caught up in doing other major projects that the aquascaping and filling up this tank just wasn't much of a priority, so we just let it sit. It still isn't exactly full of coral by any stretch, but it is filling up one chaotic week at a time. I plan to do more frequent updates of this tank. So if you enjoy this type of content, I invite you to leave a like and subscribe to this channel. Until next time guys, happy reefing.